All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Freedom Homestead and welcome to the Beyond Labels Book Club. My name is Tangi from Freedom Homestead and I have with me Anna from Fermented Homestead and then here we have Julie from Row and Co Farms. We are actually down uh, a book club member, and that would be Miss Constance. She had some um, other other appointments that she had today, so she will not be joining us today. But we do have all of all of our channel links are down in the description box below. So if you are not following uh, Anna, Julie, myself, or Miss Constance, you can find our links down below where you can subscribe. Okay, so we are uh, going through the book. The we are going through the book Beyond Labels, written by uh, Joel Salatin and Cena McCullough. And that is because we are, uh, we just want the facts. We can handle the truth. That's what we want. We just want the truth. And so uh, with all of the noise in our food culture, because we know that everybody's out to make a dollar and they're going to Mis or not mislabel things, but label things in a way that is deceiving. Um, and this helps us to cut through all of that, to find out what are we really eating? What are we really feeding our families and bringing into our homes? So uh, this week's reading, uh, since we didn't have a book club last week, was um, chapter four, Practical Bites, five through 15. So there's a lot and um, so we're going to kind of kind of try to go through these pretty quickly since we only have an hour. Um, first of all, we do want to say hello to everyone in the chats. And um, Anna or Julie, do y'all have anything you want to say before we just dive right in? Just, hey, everybody, glad you're here today and looking forward to our discussion. I will second that. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Oh, yeah. Heather's here. So I see we have B, Kimberly, Pamela, and Heather with us right now. So we are so glad that you guys are here. All right. So practical bite number five in the, uh, I didn't have time to put my, my cool labels up um, that I've been using. The practical bite five in uh, chapter four was, I'm almost there. Hang on. <laughs> I passed it. It was about eggs. I'm sorry. I try to be more together than this. Oh, thank you, Kate. We had a good time at, uh, at Baker Creek. Okay. Nope. Number six, switch to organic eggs. So in this practical bite, they talk about the behind the scenes of your organic and conventional egg laying operations which was pretty horrific, <laughs> at least from what Joel um, witnessed. Now, I will say this. Uh, my grandparents owned a commercial chicken house. We actually had two. Both of them were, actually there was four. Two of them were laying houses and two of them were broiler houses. So the laying houses, those eggs were not actually sold for consumption. Those eggs were sent off to be hatched. And so my grandparents, how the money situation worked is that they got paid by how many eggs hatched. And there's a lot of rules that you have to follow. But the way that the, um, the chicken house was, it was not as Joel had described. Of course, it, was, it had a different purpose. Um, there were no cages. All of the chickens kind of ran around in the middle of the chicken house. And there were a lot of, uh, nesting boxes, like hundreds of them. But again, when you have an egg, at least this is what they told us. When you have an egg that is coated in manure and things like that, it is least likely to hatch. And so we were not allowed to clean the eggs off using any sort of liquid or anything like that. Because as we know, those of us that have chickens, we know that there is that natural coating that is on the outside of the egg and that it 
basically seals the pores of the shell. And so that is what protected the, the little growing baby on the inside. And if you wash that off, then it exposes the pores to oxygen, bacteria, and things like that. So anyway, the reason why I'm saying all of that is because, you know, my experience from a commercial chicken house, even though it had a different purpose, was not the same. However, it was still gross. I mean, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of chickens in a small space, and there's a lot of manure, and it's very, the ammonia is crazy. Um, but yeah, so was there anything in, in this practical bite that was eye-opening for you or freaked you out <laughs> at all? Because I know it did for me. I was like, oh my gosh, I just, I never thought about the, you know, all of those things going into the egg and then it having to be essentially bleached. The part that bothered me the most was the bleaching of the eggs. I didn't know that that was a thing. I knew they washed them, but I don't know why, like, just, I don't know why it didn't occur to me that they would wash it in bleach. Like, what else would they use? Um, and I, I actively try to avoid bleach because of the gut damaging things that it has. Um, so that part was really gross. I don't know if it was that part or if it was another part where they were talking about, like, yeah, it was that part where they were talking about like the actual, um, the vat or whatever, where they clean the eggs and it, it's like the smell of it he was describing and just the revoltingness, if that can be made into a word, um, of just the, 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 just, ugh. it was gross. I'm not a germaphobe, like at all. Like I actively strive for bacteria. I don't care. I'll lick my hand. Um, but like, that was just nasty. Yeah, I agree. I, I will say the information that I read was not new to me. Um, I switched to homegrown eggs about when we started homesteading. So I'd say about 12 years ago and I have not eaten a store-bought egg since then. So I have been on board with this part of this challenge for a long time. So it was not new information, but it definitely reinforced to me like why we made the decision years ago to raise our own chickens and have our own, you know, our own eggs. And even in our situation, you know, we have a chicken coop and then we let our chickens like free range during the day and then they go back into the coop at night. And even in the situation where they're free ranging all day, their coop still gets gross. And even in the short time that they do spend in the coop where there is feces and, and manure in there is enough where you're like, yeah, that's that's gross. And so we're always working on making sure that our, our chicken coop doesn't smell. <laughs> That's the one thing controlling manure. I think anybody that has a homestead with chickens, if you are able to control the smell, which you can do with deep bedding, anybody can do it with deep bedding. If you're smelling something from your chicken coop, you don't have enough bedding in there. That's really all it is. More bedding, more bedding. Um, but anyway, yeah, this, this chapter really reinforced why we eat our homegrown eggs versus anything else. So yeah. I, I enjoyed this chapter and just making sure I knew like I'm doing the right thing. I agree. Um, I love how Kathy pointed out only Americans won't buy a dirty egg, but will eat bleached poop bombs. Yeah, that's, that's pretty. That sums it up. <laughs> yeah. That sums it up. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Mr. Tim, glad you're here. Um, yeah. So, so what they were saying uh, in, in the practical bites was to search for organic eggs. And I will say this, and I feel, I feel so dumb. So whenever you have your own chickens and they get to a certain age, their, their production slows down in the winter time. So I actually only had to buy eggs twice um, this, this past winter, which was so dumb because I actually had some in the freezer and I don't, I didn't, I didn't use them. That was not smart of me, but anyway, um, but I did one time I bought the organic pasteurized, not pasteurized, pasture raised eggs. It was like $4 for a carton and that was fine. Completely good. And when I broke open the eggs, the eggs on the outside and on the inside looked just like my eggs. So that was cool. Well, then the second time I had to buy eggs, we were really pinching pennies. And so I had to buy the cheap ones and they are still in my refrigerator because I use two of them and they look sickly. 
Like once you're used to seeing that, yeah, when you're used to seeing the organic fed, uh, you know, chickens that are raised in the sunshine and, and they've got beautiful orange uh, yolks and the shells are nice and firm. And then you go to crack open one of those white ones, the cheap ones there and they're, it does, it looks like there's something wrong with it. The good thing I think about eggs is that it's one of the easiest things to source outside of the grocery store. You can find almost every neighborhood everywhere has somebody selling chicken, chicken eggs on the side of the road, or you know someone that's doing it. And their practices are almost always going to be better than what you're going to find in a store produced egg. So yeah, even if they're not organic, organically fed, they're still free ranging and they're outside and they're not in this manure filled environment all day. So you're still better off. So eggs are a really, really easy place where you can make the change and not have to feel like you can't find, and you can find them cheap. You can find eggs cheap, even, even those organic, you know, country fed eggs. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's also, there's, there's also a good chance that you may know somebody that has eggs they are willing to give you. <laughs> I don't, I don't charge for my eggs. Please yeah. take some eggs. Um, but one thing too that too. You have to have a half dozen, I think, in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think one one of the things that you said, Julie, reminded me of what Joel Salatin said at the um, HOA business conference that we were at. Um, so that guy that had asked, you know, is it worth my while to drive two hours to pick up non-GMO organic feed for my cows or, you know, but they're, they're also grass fed. Is it okay to, to give them this other stuff? And he, he meant, he mentioned that uh, grass, um, you know, all of the goodies and grass for the animals kind of helps to purge out some of that, uh, some of the toxins that are in maybe some of the conventional feed. So yeah, like you were saying, if you, if you have, uh, you know, your next door neighbor has chickens, they let them free range, but also probably maybe gives them like the cheaper uh, feed. Um, they're still better off than what you will get your 98 cent dirty dozen <laughs> of eggs uh, chlorinated at the, at the store. Um, so, uh, practical bite number seven says no to chlorinated eggs. I feel like we've kind of already gone through all of that. So we'll just, uh, move on to practical bite number eight, if y'all don't care. Um, choose organic chicken. And I have a lot of stuff highlighted in this section. So I will let you guys go ahead and do y'all have anything that you want to share? I also did not know that. Um, that they bleach the chicken and it makes me want to vomit because I don't, I don't usually rinse off my food. I mean, I mean, I, ha I, I preface this. I haven't eaten you know, store-bought chicken in two years. Um, I've raised, that was the first thing I got on my homestead and we're still eating on them. So, but <clears throat> yuck, like now I know that if I ever buy it in the store, I got to make sure to wash it off. But now that gives me even more motivation to when we get to where we're going, like, Meat birds are going, meat birds are going in the tractor right away because that is, it just destroys your gut and it's just, and the way that they raise them as to why they have to bleach them is disgusting and, ooh. Yeah, yeah. that's the unfortunate part is the reason they have to do all the bleaching and the sanitation is because of the way they raise them. It's, it seems so backwards, like, hey, if we just go back to the regular way of doing it, even though it seems like the least sanitary to people, it's actually the most sanitary way to do it. And so it, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating to see. And, and we also, we raise our own meat birds. We have done that for quite a while. I'd say at least six or seven years, we've raised at least one big batch of meat birds every year. And so we have not used store-bought chicken in years, but I will say this, Turkey is where I have not been able to break from. I know it's not the same thing, but I'm assuming that turkeys are going to be raised almost identically to chickens. And so that's where we've had to. I'm still buying store-bought turkey and ground turkey. And, but this year we, we have purchased 15 meat bird turkeys. So we're going to attempt to raise our own turkeys this year. But yeah, I think... Uh, 
it, this is a hard one, I think, for people because it's expensive. If you don't do it yourself, buying a whole pastured chicken can cost you 30 or $40. Yeah. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And, and so I think this is a hard way for people to, I don't know, I'm not saying it's not doable because it's totally doable, but I think this is hard because meats are where you really are going to find the most price differential um, between regular and, uh, you know, conventional and organic. So I think maybe it's about cutting back some on the amount of meat you eat so you can gear it more towards the best that you can get versus, you know, trying to eat all great all the time and then, but you can't afford it. So yeah, maybe buying one whole chicken a week and spreading that out throughout the week is the way to go versus trying to have, you know, two or three a week or something like that. So I don't know. I'm, my opinion is of course, I'm going to eat organic chicken or my own, actually my own raised chicken versus other. Um, but I think this is a hard one for people to actually make happen. So I, I understand the struggle if you don't have room to raise your own and how you can eat good chicken um, from the store. Yeah. I, I, and I, that's one thing that I am very, very leery of is never, I never ever want anyone to ever feel like I'm food shaming anybody because your family has to eat period, period. And you have to do what works best for your budget and for your situation and one thing, you know, when we were going through some very slim financial times, I remember I would just keep reminding myself, it's just for a season. It's just for a season until I can get to where I can raise my own or I can buy something better. This is just for a season. So um, I just want to encourage anybody that's thinking I can't afford to eat like that. I know it's the right thing for my family, but I can't afford to do it. Like uh, Julie said, you know, there's ways that you can might make some room in your budget by having some like vegetarian nights. You know, if, if your family likes beans, then you could do a uh, pioneer woman has a fantastic taco pizza recipe where she, the base is like black beans mashed up and then spread over a pizza crust and then topped with like lettuce, tomato, cheese. And then she makes like a sauce with sour cream and hot sauce. And it is like, there's no meat on it and it is fantastic. So anyway, there's, there's, there are some ways to uh, make room in your budget, but definitely, do the best you can and don't do not never, never apologize for feeding your family the best that you can. Um, OK, so one of the things that I highlighted in this section, um, this I think Joel says this. Um, so he's talking about how he started using the term beyond organic. And he said, do you know that the National Organic Standard Board, NOSB, police, the, the NOSB police sent me threatening legal action because I wasn't allowed to use the word. And Julie, I think you actually referenced this um, during our last book club. I didn't say I was organic. I just said I was beyond organic, but even that warranted litigation from them. Fortunately, I was a member of the Farm uh, to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, called their uh, lead attorney, sent a letter, and they said it was okay to say that they were beyond organic. So the reason why I highlighted this, for one thing, because it got my blood boiling, but we had talked about before how, um, you know, there is so much red tape to even saying that you're organic. And this is one of the things why it's really good if you can source your food locally, because then you can actually talk to the farmer and you can actually ask them, how do you raise this stuff? Um, they might not be able to say that they're organic because if they did, they were they would have to charge you probably double what they've got their beets marked for. Um, but, they, but they may tell you, we use natural growing practices. So um, that was one of the things that I had highlighted. I agree. And that's one of the, re one of the things that goes into all the, you know, the conspiracy side of the food marketing or the food system is that like they, you know, in order to be able to say that I grow this thing in a healthy way, that's not chemically laden with toxic crap, you have to pay all these gobs and gobs of money. But in order, to, if you want to douse it with all these chemicals that destroy your gut and your body and give you cancer, go for it. We're going to supplement you for it. We're actually going to pay you to do it. It's ridiculous. That's why it's so expensive. It's not, it's not the farmers. The farmers aren't making any more money doing organic than they are conventional, probably less. So it's just, it sucks. Yeah, just the fact that it's all being marketed to you 
somewhere along the way is it's so overwhelming. That's why we all find it so hard to make decisions is because we've been told to eat this one way. And then we're getting marketed to by all these companies like eat this, this is the, this is the way to go. And I'm like, if you're being marketed to, it's probably not the way to go with what you need to eat. And that's so hard because we literally are marketed to for food everywhere we look everywhere, fast food, restaurants, grocery stores, individual products. I mean, everything is, is a commercial. <laughs> it's, it's scary. And you know, they're just, they just want your money. So you really have to filter through all those little terms and things. And like, what do they really have behind this? What are they really trying to accomplish here? It's probably not my best interest. It's probably their bottom dollar. And so, yeah have to look at the motivations behind a lot of these things yeah one one, one thing that i i kind of wondered so you know and uh, i think it was in that section where joel kind of talked on um how walmart has become the big uh the big market for organic foods and i actually read somewhere and it may have been in this book i can't remember where i read it but just talking about how organic foods there there is a higher demand for more organic foods. So has it occurred to, to anybody or has anyone had the thought that because the demand is higher, which means people are, are probably uh, more enlightened, um, that they might change the rules for organic food to make it easier to make money? I don't know. I'm not saying that right. But that they might try to fudge it a little bit where more can get passed through and that the, the the guidelines are not as tight as they should be for true organic food. I think that's exactly what they're doing. And that's exactly what they've done. The chemicals that are allowed on organic, organic farming are, they're pretty bad. The, the only reason that I even think about the, the reason that organic foods is more expensive is a better option is simply because of the glyophosphate, because they cannot have glyophosphate in it. Roundup, that's that's mm -hmm. that's worth the extra cost to me to make sure that at least I know for now, at least I know that they are non GMO and they don't have glyophosphate sprayed on them. Um, I think I mentioned that once before, but that that is the main reason that I would consider um, organic, because most things beyond that, I don't think that they're terribly much more, much more beta. Um, but, you know, it's worth it for that. Yeah, I think they've definitely perverted the term, you know, it's become this, it's a marketing term. It's not what it was set out to be, which was to let people know like, hey, you're getting this great product from the earth. <laughs> now it's just a marketing word that only certain companies are allowed to use if you pay enough money and do enough hoops and do enough stuff versus the actual organic practices don't need hoops they're easy and they're natural and they shouldn't need hoops to jump through to make them happen. So yeah, it's, I get that people want a regulating body to say, Hey, this is actually organic, but it's just a slippery slope. All these regulating bodies are just more bureaucracy that can be corrupted and perverted into something else. And so you, you can trust it, but you can't, I mean, you may be able to trust it in that instance, but the, what happened way down the line to get to that point is, is perverted and corrupted. So it's, it's ultimately your information is flawed most of the time. Yeah. I think the worst thing that has happened to the United States food culture is our government. Um, okay. So we're going to keep going. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep an eye on the, uh, on the uh, comments. Um, love, love reading all of them. You guys are so awesome. Okay, so we're going to move on to practical bite number nine, which is choose your disinfectant on your chicken, which I think really what they wanted to say was choose your poison. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I found super duper interesting, um, I just saw, okay, yeah, squirrel. All right. Um, one of the things that I found super duper interesting, and I guess, you know, this is one of those things where you know, but you kind of forget about it, but I love where they point out that we are more bacteria than human, which we all know that we know that there are little microscopic things that, that we host. We don't, people don't, I don't guess really want to think about it, but we do, we host 
billions and billions of bacteria all over our bodies. And so when we're consuming these foods that are chlorinated, what does chlorine do? It kills bacteria. And so all of the things that we need to survive and, and live a healthy lifestyle, because these bacteria that live on us are healthy, good bacteria, things that we need that keep infection away, that keep bad bacteria away. And then when we're eating chlorine, it's killing that good bacteria that is on us. So was there anything that uh, else that stood out to y'all? For me, it was just, just learning that like, unless you're raising it yourself or you're buying directly from the farmer, like you really don't have a choice. And just the things that you never think of that you have to look into. Like I never, it never would have occurred to me that they would bleach my chicken. Like, I don't know. Now that I've heard it, I'm like, of course they do. Like, of course they do. Why didn't that even occur to me? But like the things that you just never think of that you need to think about are innumerable. Like they'll take every opportunity humanly possible to, to destroy the food and poison you so that they can make more money. They don't care. Like that's all it's about. It's all about the Benjamins and whatever denomination is higher than that, that they've, they'll invent soon because of hyperinflation, but whatever, you know, like they don't care. Yeah. I think, I think most people just don't know how their, how their food's produced and that they're, if they really knew, you know, what's added into the chicken and into the beef and the ground and all the stuff that goes along the way that, they probably wouldn't eat it, but the industry does their best to make sure you don't know this stuff. They don't want you to know that they're spraying bleach on your chicken and that they're that your animals are living in poop all day, because really that is what it is. All of these operations that are raising animals in a building on concrete all day long, they're literally just standing in their filth all day. Poo, pee. They just, they have to stand in it. The smell is horrific, horrific. And people just don't know. They don't, they ignore it or they don't want to know. But I think if people really knew, they would make a different choice. They would opt for something else. And I think we're going to see because of the fact that fertilizer and things are going to be less over the coming years because of what's happening in um, Russia and Ukraine, that they're going to have to change the way we do some of these operations because we're, we're just not going to have the resources that we did before. So maybe this will be the turning point in some regenerative agriculture where we're going to take that poop and use it for good rather than antibiotics and sterilization and everything that goes along with that. So I know that wasn't really on topic, but it's where my mind goes. Oh no. I think that was, that was absolutely perfect because you're absolutely right. Um, Tim said uh, he shared the organic meaning of food or farming methods produced or involving production without the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or other artificial agents. And then um, let's see. I love how Kate pointed out food makes you sick and big pharma has a customer for life. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. Um Okay, let's see. Kathy has a question. What is a good way to rinse our meat that we buy to reduce the chemical effect? That's a good question. I think the only thing you can do is rinse it off. Well, I mean, that's all I can really think of because, I mean, it's in the meat. I mean, it's packaged with the chlorine in it, and it's in that shrink wrap. Like, I mean, the best you can do really is rinse it off very well. Yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar either. I don't know if the way that they spray it, if it penetrates into the meat. I don't know. I'm not familiar enough with that process to know if there's a good way to remove some of it or not. Don't know. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the things that they actually mentioned in, in some of this was that the way things are done, the feces, the chlorine, all of these things penetrate into into the meat and, and they, they coexist in there. It's not like the chlorine, you know, goes in there and gets all the poop out or whatever, but, but they coexist. And you know, it's funny because I, there have been times where I have opened a package of chicken and I'm like, why does this smell bleachy? And that's why I just, for some reason, didn't, didn't put that together. Um, 
Let's see, what else do I have highlighted? Um, okay, yeah, there was a lot of talk in this section about super bugs. Um, oh, here's, here's one. Uh, when you eat sterilized food, you sterilize your body. This is kind of what we we're talking about a, a little bit ago. Remember, you are more microbe than human. So you literally kill piece, you literally kill off pieces of yourself each time you eat chicken that has taken a bath in chlorine because the chlorine is disinfecting or killing off your own microbes. Yeah, so that was we had already talked about that. Um, and then it says in doing so, you can make yourself more susceptible to disease and infection. Um, and then Cena points out that practically all of the food in the grocery store is sterilized, and that sterility has a profound impact on our health. And she, she talked about how she, it took her years to make that connection um, with her own, her own health journey. But that really is so eye-opening. All right, we're going to move on to Practical Bike 10. Trying to get all of this in in an hour. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Kate said, because of the fertilizers, Fertilizer shortages. My friend's husband, who is a farmer, has been to has been to three states trying to work with chicken farmers to buy poop to use for his field. So there you go. There you go. Um, let's see. Heather says it sits on the meat for a length of time during packaging and shipping, so you can't really help it. I think she's referring to the the bleach um, that's on the chicken. Um, a couple of people are suggesting um, a vinegar soak, maybe helping with um, lifting some of that uh, off. Um, and Karen said, eat venison. <laughs> that's awesome. Yep, that, that's a really great uh, local um, protein that you can eat. Um, all right, so... Practical bite number 10, don't waste your money on free range or pasture raised. And can I also mention, if you see on your package of chicken that those chickens are vegetarian fed, run. It's <laughs> my, my chickens eat everything. They eat meat, they eat bugs, they eat greens, they eat everything. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. And I think a lot of us, too, when we read that, we probably think of Justin Rhodes, how um, chickens are carnivores or dinosaurs, not carnivores, dinosaurs. Yeah. When you hear vegetarian fed, just think corn fed. That, that just means corn fed. <laughs> Lots of GMO corn probably going into those chickens. Oh, and yeah. Soy. Do what? And soy. And soy. Yeah. Soy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think this chapter was definitely, this is what wakes you most when you see those, that free range and pasture raised, what the definitions or what is allowed for that is not what's in your imagination where you're like, oh, they're roaming the green fields, they're, they're pecking and hunting for bugs. No, they're allowed to go in a little spot about this big in a cage still outside um, that gets a little sunshine and they come back. Like it's not a pasture. It's, it's, a, it's a farce. <laughs> it's a lie. It's all a lie. So yeah, spending money on those things. Now it's not to say that every company that's making eggs is lying about being pastured. Some of them are pasturing their, their, their animals, but the term itself is, loose it's very loose in what they mean by pasture raised and free range so use yeah. caution yeah and i like how you know later on uh in that section joel talks about grass-fed cows he said if they've ever eaten a blade of grass in their entire life <laughs> then oh they're grass-fed and he said that's why a lot of folks have started also using the term grass finished um because that means they ate grass their whole life and not just, you know, they had a salad once. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, again, yeah, just going back to local or you're doing it yourself really is the best way to know what you are eating. Yeah. That was one that really bothered me. Cause like I, I, up until I read that chapter, I totally thought that pasture raised or, um, free range or whatnot meant something. And I was very just like, 
I, I guess I probably felt just like Cena did where it was like, I thought I was doing the right thing, you know, like, cause there are times where, you know, I, my chickens don't produce during the winter or right now we don't have chickens cause we're in an Airbnb, which is basically an apartment in between homesteads. And like, so I'm going to have to buy eggs and it's like, I always made sure to buy the organic free range pasture raised stuff. And it's like, ugh. I got to drive around, but thankfully it's kind of in the country. So now I got to like drive down all these side roads until I find somebody who's raising a non GMO uh, chicken eggs. But um, I was really, really disappointed about that one. And I did know about the grass fed versus grass finished part. Um, I've always been pretty careful about the meat and stuff that I source, especially like where I work. We, we actually serve um, grass finished beef. And I've actually been to the factory. I've been to the slaughterhouse and I know how they, they manage everything. So I feel very comfortable eating that meat. And then we just make sure that we once every year or every other year, we just buy a whole cow and stick it in the freezer. And right now we're running pretty low, which makes you kind of nervous with all the food store shortages going on. But like that's, I told my husband, like literally as soon as we get to our new place, like the first thing we're doing is buying a cow. Like that's it. We're buying a cow. We're putting it in our freezer. I don't, just, you don't get an opinion we're doing it so anyways that's that's what i've been doing about goats too <laughs> um yeah tim said chickens eat anything i saw my i have seen mine eat baby mice and snakes yes, yes. i love i love it i love it and what one of the cool things about nature in general is how you, you can so, I mean, I guess this was with people too. What they produce is obviously, you know, uh, from what they have eaten. And I love how I can tell, uh, you know, like um, when the, if we know when it's warmer outside and the chickens can free range more, um, you know, the, just the color of the yolks, how they, they, they change slightly. They'll be more vibrant. Or um, I even saw where somebody, what book was I reading? I think it was a, a Lisa Steele, one of her books, where she was talking about how when your chickens, um, some people give chickens marigolds to make their yolks even more vibrant, like more orange and, and things like that. So that, I think that's just, that's so cool. Um, of course, on the same take, I've, I've all, always read, was it, did Laura Ingalls Wilder write about when the cow would get into the wild onions because it would make the, the milk taste off? If it wasn't her, I read something somewhere like that. Maybe it was Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> the part when the movie where he's tasting the milk. Maybe that's where I got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Heather says, sorry, my computer is being really slow. The connection between native diet and health isn't just for humans. Chickens are not vegetarians. Cats and dogs are not kibbletarian. I love that. Um, this is actually really uh, a really cool thing. So one of our friends, uh, Aaron, his his parents are preppers, and um, they raise meat rabbits for their dogs. And I just thought that was really cool. The reason why I brought up a prepper because it made me think. You know, that's a that's a fantastic sustainable way to feed your dog um you know if you can't get to a grocery store and buy the kibble which they don't need the kibble anyway they need a raw diet but um anyway but yeah i thought that was that was really cool um oh uh, let's see rose says purdue does that with the marigolds that's why their skin is yellowish that's just well, that's deceptive is what that is they're they're trying to make their uh chickens appear healthy I don't know. Do your backyard chickens have a yellowish tint when you butcher them? They do. So that's what they're doing. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, Karen's Garden says, I remember that in the spring, the milk would taste green if the cows are too much fresh grass. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and then our, our one more comment here a whole rabbit is a complete meal nutritionally organ bone meat ratio is perfect but it does need more fat we have a book called how to survive in the woods it's about how to survive in the woods and one of the things that the author points out is that man cannot live on rabbit alone because there's not enough fat for sustainability but yeah uh, that but that's awesome though that you can that you can use the whole animal um for that um, okay, 
So we're going to go ahead and move on to, we're actually doing pretty well because we've only got two bites left and we're 30 minutes in. So yay us. So maybe I can maybe not talk so fast. Um, so uh, practical bite number 13, avoid artificial and natural flavors. How infuriating is it to get a hold of something that you think, oh, this might actually be a good, a good thing to get. And then you read the um, ingredients and it says natural flavors. Like, just tell me what it is. I want to know, am I eating, am I eating uh, the, you know, the excretions of a beaver bum? Like, what is the natural flavor? I need to know. Um, I have a comment definitely about this. So I didn't concern myself with flavorings for a long time. Um, but last year when I got my diagnosis of alpha gal syndrome, um, if you guys are not familiar, alpha gal syndrome basically is a tick borne illness uh, that makes you allergic to a sugar called alpha galactose. Um, and that sugar is found in all mammals. So basically you become allergic to mammals and meat and everything that is part of that. So um, many of those natural flavorings um, contain mammal ingredients, which I'm finding out, um, but they don't have to tell you what the natural flavoring is. Those can be proprietary um, recipes or whatever they decide that they are in a company, and they never have to disclose what those natural flavoring, flavorings are. It can be a combination of chemicals. It can be plants. It can be mammals. It can be all kinds of things. And so that word natural flavor is almost like allergy alert for me. It's almost always for me, <laughs> it's, it's mammal based <laughs> and it usually affects me. So yeah, natural flavor is, is the devil. <laughs> it really can be thousands and thousands of different things and they never have to tell you what it is. All right. Vegans would be very mad if they knew the natural flavorings that are in so many things. And there's you guys, mammals are in everything. I mean, everything. They really do use the whole animal and, and it goes into products that you would not believe. And luckily, I don't get affected by all those things. But there are many people with alpha gal that can't sit on a leather sofa or can't touch an animal. I'm luckily I can touch animals and that's okay, but I can't eat them. But yeah, I think you're right, Heather. Vegans would be very mad if they knew what natural flavorings actually were. Yeah, it's a uh, we we had some friends that came and stayed with us and they are, they're vegan. And I mean, I, I know that we rely heavily on animal products in, in this house. We rely heavily on animal products. But then when I went to shop for things that they could eat, I was, I was really surprised. I was having a hard time finding things that didn't have something animal related in it. So we did stick with, you know, anything that was labeled, um, like vegan, but if you, if it says plant-based, but not vegan, then you have to, you have to really read the, um, ingredients. Um, uh, so people are putting in the comments, things that they heard is included in the natural flavors section. Yeah. It's, um, whenever you look at the, at the ingredients on a package, and you're, you know, this, this is what was eye opening for me when we got into the homesteading or when, when I got, got on this rabbit trail of homesteading, it was when I make bread, I use five ingredients. The bread that I buy from the store has 25 ingredients. It's insane. And so it's like, you know, when you're shopping it's like, do, would I have these things in my pantry? Like, could I make this? with these ingredients. Um, and so if the answer is no, then yeah, you're, you're, you're looking at something that's crazy processed. Um, <laughs> Tim. Um, that was funny. Vegan is an old Indian word for bad hunter. <laughs> yeah. 
This is this is funny. Uh, Rose said, I went to college near Oscar Mayer. Slogan there is we use everything but the squeal. <laughs> mm, yummy. They would use that if they could make money on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Um, okay. Uh, let's see. I was trying to think if there was, I mean, there's a whole lot in here about uh, government labeling. And I mean, it's it really is. Oh, it's terrifying. Um, okay, so moving on to practical bite number 14, choose preservative free. Uh, read the list of ingredients on every food item in your pantry, refrigerator, and freezer. If preservatives are listed, do not buy those foods again. It can be tricky knowing which ingredients are preservatives. So here's a good starting point. When looking at the ingredient list, the word preservative is often listed in parentheses following the ingredient. So you can look for words no preservatives or preservative free on the food packaging. So can you ladies tell me what's, what's wrong with preservatives? Well, I, th this is the one that I actually had a pen with. So I highlighted something from this section. Um, the rest of it, I was kind of reading here and there in my car, but basically the preservatives are added to the food to prolong the shelf life. Some preservatives work by preventing the food from being broken down or eaten by microorganisms like mold, bacteria, fungi, and yeast. Um, that well, it sits on the grocery store shelves. But remember, you have microorganisms in your gastrointestinal tract that you need in order to break down your food. So if you're eating all of these preservative, preservatives that are designed to make it so that you cannot, that um, uh, it won't break down, it's not going to break down in your body either. And then it also is going to just, it's, it's a lot of them in, the, in this chapter, uh, one of them in particular is a chelator. And it, it prevents the, it basically, it, it gets all the, um, the, the bad stuff, but it also takes like the calcium and other, other things with it and takes it out of your body. So it can make you deficient in a bunch of different vitamins and minerals and whatnot, because it makes it so that it's not available. Like you think you're consuming all of these vitamins, which I mean, when you, when you consume the, um, the processed foods, you're already at a nutritional loss. But when you also factor in all the other things, your body just can't absorb the food that you're eating. And it's not that it's just, you know, a net, net, net zero, like it's, it's a negative, like it pulls good stuff out of your body with it. Yeah, I've definitely heard over the years that even uh, they've proven that soda, for instance, that you drink it and drink it and drink it. And it's pulling the calcium out of your bones because your body is no longer able to absorb calcium anymore. And that's just one example of one product that's doing something like that where it's where it's taking stuff away. So, yeah, the preservatives are this. It's the same as that whole sanitation process. You're taking away the thing that makes it healthy for your body. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, again, got to choose fresh over preserved anytime that you can, or the pres preservation method needs to be a natural preservation method, dehydration, fermentation, freezing, you know, freeze drying. Those methods are okay. You're not adding a chemical to the product to, to let it sit there for longer. It's, it's just doing a natural preservation method. You don't need um, all those other ways. There are ways to preserve foods, as we all know, because we do it all the time. We don't need their ways. That's, that's an excellent point. And have you guys seen, I'm pretty sure it was uh, the documentary uh, Super Size Me. Have y'all seen that? Where the guy lives on McDonald's for, is it 30 days? And he gains like, I want to say 60 pounds and his blood pressure goes through the roof. And I mean, it was really gross watching it <laughs> just because the trick, he was eating it every single meal. Everything he ate came from McDonald's. He didn't eat anything else the whole month. And one of the experiments that they did in the documentary was he took a, a, the McDonald's hamburger, just the single hamburger with nothing on it, just the, the bread and the meat and then French fries. And they, they put them under a cloche and, and it sat there for the whole month and it never molded. It never changed. It looked exactly the same the whole 30 days. It was, it was nuts. There's an ongoing project of that. And I think there's one that's been going for several years 
where the stuff basically still looks like it did. I mean, think about it. When you're in the car and you ate your McDonald's fries and they fell down between the seat and then six months later you went to clean it up and the fry yeah. didn't mold, it still looks like a French fry. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. it's not breaking down in your body either. It's doing right. the same thing. It's just sitting on the floor of your car yeah. <laughs> doing nothing, <laughs> collecting <Right>. dust. <laughs> Yeah, it's, and that's something else, too, that's amazing to me. So when we were doing this um, fermentation collaboration that Anna was doing, uh, who was it that somebody did clabber cheese? I can't remember who it was. Which to me, it was who? Sage and Stone. I think. Sage and Stone. Sage and okay. Stone. Yeah. So one of the things that I remember reading, and I'm pretty sure it was in the Art of Fermentation by um, Sander Katz. Um, when I think of spoiled milk, it to me it's a huge like you know i so when when i hear clabber cheese my mind automatically goes to spoiled milk but it's not the same thing obviously nobody would eat it because clabber milk comes from raw milk right and so there is all of the beneficial enzymes and bacteria in raw milk so whenever there's that separation that happens between the curds and the whey it's actually something quite delicious but whenever you take milk that you bought from the store and you set it out on the counter for a few days, you're going to have something completely different because it lacks all of that good, that good bacteria and all that good stuff. So, I mean, I don't know, to me, that's just, it's like, wow, you know, we, we, we do all of these things to make them be able to sit in the refrigerator longer in the store. Um, and, and no telling, I, does anybody know how long, before you buy a store-bought gallon of regular conventional milk, how old is that milk? Does anybody know? And then I'm, I'm guessing, so clabbered milk, it, it just sits on the counter for like a day, right? A day or two days um, at room temperature. Uh, and, and then you have that separation. But there's, there's no telling uh, how long, how old that milk is. And also eggs. There's... There's no telling how old eggs are by the time you bring them home from the grocery store, how old they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially if you're getting the milk that is in like the ultra pasteurized, the stuff that comes in the cartons is even though most of that is your, or, you'll find your, a lot of your organics in those, but those have been completely ultra sterilized. Like there is nothing left in those. That's good. And I, and I can't lie. Those are the ones that I end up buying most of the time because I don't get to get raw milk as often as I want to, but those are honestly the worst ones to get. It doesn't matter that they're organic because they've been so pasteurized that there's no good bacteria left in them. So yeah, it's, it's sad. <laughs> it's sad. Yeah. I, I've heard some horrible things too about if you were to do a microscopic panel on milk from these big commercial dairies, the stuff that's actually in there, you do not want to consume things that come from the cow that don't need to be in the milk. And I don't know if, if all of the ultra pasteurization actually gets any of that out, but it's, it, it sounds quite disgusting. Like pus? Yes. I've always heard that like pus, blood, feces. That's because they, they don't respect their mastitis. Like they milk mm -hmm. them anyway. Yeah, that's that's what I had always heard. Yep. And it's it's really it's really disgusting. Yeah. Um, okay, so choose preservative free, and then we're gonna get on practical bite number fifteen. Oh, this is my favorite one. I think anyone that has dabbled in keto at all has a big big appreciation for fat. Uh, don't fear the fat label. Okay, so. Oh, my mind just went blank on the who the president was. Okay, so this is something I think I think I learned this on um, the documentary called The Magic Pill, which has Joe Salatin in it, actually. Um, I believe they kind of touch on that back in the early 50s, whoever the president was at that time, my mind has gone blank, had a heart attack. Does this sound correct? And then this was when the food pyramid was born. Yeah. And the fat free, low fat movement was born. Yeah. And so uh, and I think this is really when we start to see a big decline in the health of the population. Um, yes. Heather said fat is critical for your health. Whenever you relearn, when you relearn mm -hmm. nutrition and you find out how 
wonderful and important good healthy fats are um it, and it is i completely understand you know i know back in the 80s back when i was a child um this is you know you see diet cokes and fat free this and fat free that fat free dressings and all this other kind of stuff and so you're you're told your entire life that fat is bad you don't want um, you know, too much fat. We don't need to fry this or we don't need to put too much butter. We need to use margarine, um, you know, all of this other stuff. And we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And it's because like everything that we've talked about, what we are eating is pulling the nutrients out. And then we're told to stay away from the things that help to help you to absorb good nutrients. Um, fat helps you to absorb certain minerals and vitamins. It's also super, super good for your brain. There's tests that show that uh, people that so suffer with Alzheimer's and dementia, how there is a huge improvement in their state when they are given a high fat diet, fats being um, from uh, grass fed, grass finished beef and eggs and avocados and coconut and all of these other things. So it is it is so, so good for you and so, so important that you get the right healthy fats. Obviously, not not all fats are created equal. But um, yeah, so what, what are y'all's thoughts on this? I love fats. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, the, they, they turned everyone away from the animal fats and said, here, use these great fats instead. Let's use canola oil, seed oil, sunflower oil, all those, you know, highly, what is, what's the word? Um, mm -hmm. Highly processed. I, I'll think of the word in a minute. <laughs> hydrogenated hydrogenated oils um and those are terrible they're they cause so much inflammation in the body and everyone just still using them every fast food place you go into that's what they're frying that their fries in um so if you really want to avoid those seed oils man you got to stay away from fast food like that is where the majority of that stuff lies and everyone is frying in those there but anyway Yes, we use we use good fats at our, our house. We, of course, don't use lard or tallow because of the allergy, but we use duck fat and chicken fat. And it is very important if you're going to use those types of fats, animal fats, whether it's chicken or uh, chicken fat or duck fat or, or pig, that it is from a pastured animal because that's where the nutrients that are in that fat are going to help you. Um, if you're just using the lard from the grocery store, it is not the same thing. It is not going to be the same beneficial um, nutrients that are in it. It's not going to help carry vitamins and minerals in it the same way. Um, but yeah, we, we love our animal fats. We get chicken fat from Azure Standard. Um, we also get unrendered duck fat from a farm in Tennessee. They send it to us. And then we also, when we butcher our chickens, we cut off all the fat that we can get and we render that separately. And then we also, um, so when I do like a chicken broth, every week I make a bone broth out of, uh, out of a chicken that I have. And when I get done with that broth and I put it in the container and let it cool, there'll be a layer of fat on the top of that. I scoop that off and that's what I cook my vegetables in for the week. And so I'm constantly getting more chicken fat off of a new thing that I'm using. So yeah, we love our animal fats, our coconut oil, avocado oil, um, olive oil, all those kind of things. Heather said, avoid industrial fats, canola, rapeseed, soybean, peanut, safflower, sunflower, high oleic is an exception cotton seed, et cetera. Um, I also want to share that I purchased uh, some pork fat from a, a local farmer at the farmer's market. It was only a couple of bucks a pound and um, was able to bring that home and render it myself. And which is a very easy process. You can do it in your crock pot. You can do it on your stove. You can do it in the oven. There's like, there's so many different ways that you can do it. And it's not hard at all. And it is so delicious and very satisfying to do yourself. Um, so if you are having a hard time finding healthy lard, uh, see if there is a local farmer uh, in your area, see if you have a farmer's market. Um, and there's many different um, videos on YouTube. I know I have one on uh, rendering beef tallow and it's the same, it's the same process. It's so easy. And it's like she said, super delicious. I never thought about using chicken fat until that day I was making, um, 
I was making some chicken bone broth and you're like, save the fat and cook your veggies in it. And I was like, oh, that sounds really, really good. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's de definitely easy ways that you can, uh, source good, healthy fat. And, um, let's see, I uh, also wanted to share this one too from Heather fatty acid balance is important to manage inflammation. Too many omega sixes drive drives inflammation. Animal fats from poorly raised animals are a perfect ratio of or properly, not poorly, I'm sorry, <laughs> That's, that would be different. Animal fats from properly raised animals are a perfect ratio of both. And this is uh, one thing that I've learned from listening to uh, Thomas DeLauer, who is on um, on YouTube, and he is a, I guess you would call him, is he a food scientist? Like, what is he? I don't know. He just knows a lot about all of the different the sciences of food. And uh, that was one thing I remember him talking about was whenever you're eating a conventionally raised, uh, when you're eating conventionally raised animal proteins, they're, they're very high in omega sixes because of their diet. Um, if they're eating a lot of corn and soy, they're going to be full of omega sixes, but having a good balance of the omega threes kind of helps to neutralize that omega six, which the omega six can, can, um, uh, cause uh, inflammation as well as the corn and the soy and all that stuff. So yeah, having that is uh, very, very important. I think definitely for anybody who does kind of fear the fat, look into the history of why, like around the time that everything happened with Eisenhower and the, they were, the American Heart Association was coming up with their, you know, recommendations and all that kind of stuff as to how people should eat and just all the lobbying and um, everything that happened. I, I tried to look up um, the guy, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, there, there was a- Ansel Keys, Ansel Keys. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yes, absolutely. That's the guy that I'm talking about. And like, like he, I can't remember the, um, there was another guy there as well, but the, it was basically two guys who were just going at it, trying to, to get what they, you know, Ansel Keys was being paid by the sugar industry. And then this other guy was like, no, like everything that you're saying is false and it's fake. And they basically just like Ansel Keys just like ruined his life and, and like attacked him and went after him. And then he ended up winning. And that's why we ended up, they ended up going with the the recommendation for the low fat and the high sugar, like it has nothing to do with science. It's all this dude who wanted to win and he was being bought off and paid, paid for by the sugar industry because they wanted their stuff to be, um, to reign supreme. Basically it's, it's, there's zero science behind it. The science is yeah. actually, the they didn't do any research when they did that. And they didn't do any research after they implemented it either. And so they let people just go and they didn't do any research for years after that, before mm -hmm. they finally said, Hey, well, maybe we should see if this actually works. And when they started doing the research, they found that it didn't work. <laughs> they found that the high sugar, hard, high carb diet was what was driving all of this disease that they were promoting all this time. So yeah, yeah. that comes from in the next chapters. A lot of this is going to get hit on in the next chapters because I'm mistakenly read too far. So yeah, we're going to talk about, we're gonna be talking about this soon. <laughs> All right. So we have about seven minutes left. Um, I like how Heather just mentioned that industrial oils are deodorized. So we don't smell the rancid oil smell. They would otherwise smell like fish that had gone bad. That is disgusting. Mm -hmm. um, and Kathy said, this section blew my mind. My nutritionist had always said so, but never explained the why of it. So no more fat guilt here. That's awesome. Um, oh, Tony Renee said that the story that, that you all were just talking about is, um, in, in nourishing traditions, which I have that book. I haven't, I haven't read all the way through it yet. I've been, uh, mostly looking at the recipes, but, uh, and let's see, uh, see, nope, we're going to see Heather said, we're still fighting to get the dietary guidelines changed to follow the science. Isn't that funny how people keep railing on following the science and they're the ones that are actually not following the science. But anyway, that's, that's a whole different story. going around a lot these days. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, it all just makes me laugh. We just, <laughs> we, we knew about the stuff before it was cool, y'all. We're, we're going to eat real food now. And in, in five more years, they're going to say, man, we should have been eating real food all along, guys. And we're going to say, yeah, we told you so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, me. All right. So um, any final thoughts? 
And and what we write here? If that, if I you, don't if have you, it. <laughs> We're all flipping through our book. Uh, Let me make sure. Yeah. I was just going right. to say that when you're um, going to the grocery store, don't assume that that the people who produce the food that you're consuming have your moral values because they don't. They're all about money. They're all about profit. Anything that you think they would never do that, they're doing it. They don't care. They genuinely don't care. They will do anything and everything to cut corners. These people, they, I mean, it's not to say that everybody who works for these companies is that way, but like the people in the higher ups in these companies, the ones who make the decisions, the one who come up with the formulas, all that kind of stuff. They're heartless. They're soulless. They only care about money. They don't care about you. They don't care about your health. They'll put anything on the packaging to get you to buy it, to think that it's healthier. It's not. Don't buy stuff with packaging. Like if, if you can avoid it, just don't buy stuff that has a package. Buy the fruit in the, you know at the farmer's markets and talk to them and all that stuff whenever possible. Like I have a, I have a local co-op here and thankfully I can now start to shop there again with the recent changes that we've had in our state and they have tremendous um, produce there and it's fantastic. There's gotta be places near you around you, whole foods. I mean, I hate supporting whole foods, but at least they will probably have some good food um, you know, better food than, than what you could find at, you know, like your local, you know, mom and pop shop. I don't know. And not that I wouldn't want to promote a local mom and pop shop, but ultimately you got to do what you got to do to, to promote your health. And if you buy stuff in the, the big fancy packaging, you're not doing that. True. Um, I guess my final thoughts would be since this year, things are getting weird or weirder. <laughs> Isn't that, if that's even a thing. Um, I'm just going to encourage everybody to, plant a garden. If mm -hmm. you plant a garden, plant it because things are going to get real weird in the store. And it's not even going to be about reading a label. It's going to be about, can we find anything to eat at all? So yeah, if you can grow it yourself, you should grow something, anything now, because we're going to see a lot of inflation, a lot of food shortages, and all those things are just going to keep compounding on us. Uh, for the rest of this year and into the next coming years, it's going to be a really rough year for farming. And I mean the big industrial farming, and that's going to affect a lot of people. If we're homesteading, that's great. We're going to be able to alleviate some of the pressure on the system because our food system is going to be stretched thin this year and next. So if you can grow some of your own to alleviate that pressure in the store for those people that can't, then I encourage you to do that. So those are my final thoughts for the day. And all of those things that you grow, they're going to be organic because you're not going to spray them or do anything nasty to them. So there you go. I think, I think if I keep nodding, I think my head's going to fall off. Right? <laughs> amen. Amen. To head head. Head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, when, um, when uh, Anna was saying all her stuff and she was just like rolling out with it, I was like, Ooh, might drop. And then you come in with grow a garden. I'm like, yeah. But uh, yeah, and one thing too, if you uh, here on YouTube, there is a fantastic uh, documentary called The Wartime Kitchen and Garden. I have actually been watching that again just to kind of refresh some of the ideas because I mean, we this is this is our reality right now. OK, um, I know we don't want to have to think about going into another war, but it is a good possibility and things are already difficult, like Julie was saying. We're already seeing um, uh, empty store shelves and we're already uh, having, you know, we've got uh, truckers on um, on strike and we've got inflation and we've got all of these different things. So it's, it's already happening. We just need to accept it and we need to take steps forward to make sure that our families are taken care of. And so 100% on the uh, grow a garden. I saw Heather even said, get some chickens, grow a garden. And, and we are all... Uh, I mean, I know we're expanding our growing space here um, and it is we're all we're all going to need to consider having victory gardens of our own. Um, and so, you know, faith over fear, just be aware. Don't put don't keep your head in the sand and uh, make sure that you and your family are taken care of. And if that means that you have to go to the store and you have to buy conventional things that your family will have to eat, that's fine. It's for a season. We do the best we can where we're at. Uh, just, you know 
just do the best you can. And um, anyway, this was a great, oh, I feel so good about this live stream. It was so awesome. You guys are awesome. And you guys in the chats are awesome. This is, this hour has flown by like it always does. So um, for next week, let's uh, read Practical Bites 16 through 20. Try to keep it at five, five bites a week. And um, yeah, and we'll, and we'll meet back here. Do y'all know if you'll be available next Wednesday? Good. And hopefully Constance will be, be, be back with us. Um, so anyway, that's it for today, you guys. You all are amazing. And until next time, remember to be vigilant, be prayerful, and be prepared. And we will catch y'all next week, Lord willing. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Uh...